We will begin with Miles McLaughlin. Good afternoon. I am Miles McLaughlin, a sixth grade star student at Darnell Cookman School of the Medical Arts. On December 12th, Youth Leaders the Amistad Foundation collaborated with local, state, and national policy. Sorry, excuse me. We discussed four major topics that are impacting the lives of America's children and engaged with adult leaders to create solutions. One of the issues that we discussed was the COVID-19 vaccine. The Amistad Foundation is comprised of youth grades 6 to 12 who are solution-oriented stars, smart, talented, and resilient students who are destined to change the world. During the virtual Leader to Leader Summit, the students proposed a solution to ask health officials to explain risk and benefits associated with the COVID-19 vaccine in order that we could, in turn, share the knowledge with the community. We are so grateful and excited that Florida Times Union staff who and who were also participants in this summit listened to us and answered us with the partnership to provide a platform for the conversation. Thank you, Florida Times Union, for believing in us, listening to us, and partnering with kids ages 12 to 18 to help us make a difference. Tonight's conversation will be informative, empowering, and educational. In order to make an enlightened decision regarding the COVID-19 vaccination, people need facts. There is a great deal of misinformation, conspiracy theories, and opinions swirling around this subject area. Our goal tonight is to ask questions from credible medical experts who can shed light and tell us what the science says. I am Journey Butler, and it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's panel. Dr. Bethany Atkins. Dr. Atkins is a pediatric specialist in Jacksonville, Florida, and has over 27 years of experience in the medical field. She is a graduate of the University of Florida's Medical School and is affiliated with Baptist Medical Center, Jacksonville. Sophia Upshaw. Mrs. Upshaw is a biomedical engineering PhD student who attends Georgia Institute of Technology. She was one of two black participants in Moderna's first 45 person COVID-19 vaccination trial. Monica Valdez Lupe. Ms. Valdez Lupe, JDMPH, brings more than 20 years of experience in public health to her role as Managing Director of Health with the Cres Heath Foundation. She was also a Senior Advisor to the CDC Foundation and its COVID-19 effort. Dr. Kim Barbell Johnson. Dr. Barbell Johnson is a male clinic family physician. She currently serves as the senior physician investigator and medical trials director at Care Partners Clinical Research. She has been the principal investigator for more than 70 clinical trials, including vaccine research trials. She currently leads the occupational health and COVID-19 workplace exposure risk and mitigation effort for nearly 300 employees at Family Care Partners. Rounding out our panel are two distinguished doctors from the Jacksonville community. Leon L. Haley Jr. Dr. Haley is a CEO of the UF Health Jacksonville and serves as a professor of emergency medicine and dean of the University of Florida College of Medicine, Jacksonville. He also serves as a vice president for the health affairs of the U University of Florida. Dr. Rogers Ch Kane. Dr. Kane is a family medicine specialist in Jacksonville and has over 35 years of experience in his medical field. Dr. Kane is a graduate of the Morehouse School of Medicine and is heavily involved with the Minority Physicians Research Alliance. And now, my it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, 
Mr. Mark Woods is a distinguished columnist at the Florida's Time Union. Please welcome Mr. Mark Woods to the um, platform. Thanks for everybody for being here. I'm really excited about the mix of both medical expertise and, and students. This gives me hope for the future. I was thinking I've never been so excited to see somebody get a shot as I was to see Dr. Haley get a shot this past week or to uh, think about getting one myself. Um, but I get why there's questions and concerns. Um, so I think this is wonderful to be doing this. And we wanna start by having Dr. Haley um, talk to us for a few minutes. So thanks so much for, for being here. My pleasure. I'm going to share my screen just a little bit. I know that I have uh, just a few minutes of time, but just wanted to um, um, just give a few remarks and, and certainly feel free to make sure that I can answer some questions for you, although there are certainly a number of experts that are on the screen. So just real quick, just a little bit about background, tell you about transmission things that you're probably aware of, but just as a reminder, a little bit about the devastating data that we're currently dealing with as it relates to COVID. Uh, maybe a slide or two on the implications for African Americans and underserved populations, some treatment options, and then where are we and where do we next step? So this is the COVID vaccine. This is the picture on the left that you've seen and you've become very familiar with, uh, but this is what it really looks on the right, and you can see how the artists have taken to it. It's a single-strand RNA virus, so it's actually very similar to other coronaviruses. As a matter of fact, there are seven total coronaviruses, including the thing that we call the common cold, but this is a new one. That's why it's called COVID-19 and it has been uh, obviously devastating across our community. We think it goes back to, if you can think about a year ago in 2019 to Wuhan, China, um, and there's uh, lots of conspiracy theories about whether or not it was started in the lab or whether it was started as an experiment. Um, but what we probably know is that it really is a virus that has moved from animals to humans. And so the current theory is that it was probably a virus that started out in a bat host um, and then transmitted to an intermediate host, and that's the pangolin, which is a popular pet in China, and then ultimately um, became to in infect humans. And we believe that that may have occurred through some of the markets that are in China, but largely something that is a virus that has moved from animals to another animal to humans. And this is how it spreads, and this is really the facts that we have, and this is why you've heard us time and time again really talk about your mask and your distancing and washing your hands. So the virus that causes COVID-19 is mainly transmitted through droplets generated when a person sneezes or coughs or exhales. And um, the six feet is, uh, is at least a reasonable thing, but we know that there have been literature that would suggest that people can spread it even farther than that. And that's when the mask and your shields become increasingly important. It is a devastating disease, over 73 million cases in the world. That's as of yesterday, 1.6 million deaths. In the United States, 16.7 million cases, 300,000 deaths. That's the equivalent to a daily 911. I think many of you are old enough or starting to get old enough to have been alive since that occurred, or at least know the history behind it. But can you imagine almost 3,000 deaths every day from 9-11? But that's essentially what we have right now as it relates to COVID. And in Florida, we have 1.24 million cases and over 20,000 deaths. And unfortunately, our numbers continue to rise even here in Duval County. Why that's particularly important is this is a quick graph that just looks at the number of people that not only get COVID, but end up getting hospitalized. And that's really where we start to worry. So there's a spread, but then there's a significant number of people who get infected. And over the summer, you can see that big spike in the middle. We got very busy, brought it down through the course of the early fall. But unfortunately, as you can see, that number is starting to trail back up. And we are starting to see even more admissions in all of our hospitals. That's particularly important in the underserved and African-American communities like um, Hispanics, um, Asians, and American Indians. But you can see the rate of cases hospitalizations and deaths are all significantly increased um, for Black and African Americans. And that's a function of many, many different things that we can talk through. But a lot of it is around comorbidities in terms of hypertension and diabetes um, and high cholesterol and obesity, as well as, quite frankly, many of our frontline essential workers um, and their access to care um, also contribute to that. So unfortunately, there is no cure for COVID, at least at this point, although I can tell you scientists are certainly diligently working on them. So what are we left with? Wearing your mask, washing your hands, and keeping your social distance. Those are the things that are absolutely going to be critical for us continuing forward as we try and battle the vaccine, I mean, as we try and battle what happens forward. 
we do have a new tool and that's the vaccine. There are two that are now gonna be publicly available, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, which should come out next week. They are both messenger RNA vaccines, which means they are created in the lab. They are not live viruses. What they do is they get injected into your skin, they enter the cell, create a protein, and develop an antigen that really helps to help activate your immune system and create the appropriate immune response. And so both those vac vaccines are gonna be soon available. Pfizer, like I said, start on Monday. I was the first person in the um, state of Florida to receive that vaccine three days ago. I had a little bit of muscle soreness, but other than that, I've tolerated it incredibly well. So that's just a very quick overview. I know I'm sure you guys have lots of questions, but this just give you a quick run through of where we are with COVID-19 and the vaccine and how we can continue to roll that out. You're on mute, Mark. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Haley. Um, so who wants to, I know we had a bunch of questions. Who wants to start off? Start off. My name, hello. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening. My name is Maya McLaughlin. I am a senior at First Coast High School. And for you, Dr. Haley, my first question is, uh, what advice would you give people who are very skeptical or have skepticism about the vaccine? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's really something that people are concerned about. I can tell you even in our environment, um, uh, some of our nursing staff and physician staff are a little bit concerned. So here's what I would tell you. So um, many aspects of this vaccine were already being worked on. So there are a number of people who have been studying the coronavirus um, for a number of years. So it's not a new study for many of our scientists. So they have been working on it for a number of years. What they were helped with was the expertise of other scientists who participated, governmental support and funding, private support, and really the collective scientific uh, world focusing on a single disease and putting all of their effort behind it. Please feel comfortable in knowing that the disease went through the appropriate steps in terms of phase one, two, and three trials. And I think you, somebody was introduced who was a participant in one of Moderna, tri Moderna trials. The Pfizer vaccine was tested on over 35,000 people. The Moderna vaccine was tested on over 40,000 people. And really the outcome of that they were looking at was, does it prevent a person from being infected? And the literature would tell us at this point, when you look at those two trials, the people who um, received the vaccine did not get infected affected by COVID. Um, yes, it was quick. Yes, it was uh, fast, but it went through all the necessary steps, went through all of the review process. I think Dr. Kim Johnson, I think, sat through the Moderna um, testimony today um, and so goes through all of the science and is out there. So I felt comfortable enough, although I know people were worried, which is why I wanted to be one of the first people to go and prove that to my teams and to the public um, that we felt that this was a very safe vaccine. Okay. Great. Um, did Faith Sampson, did I see you had your hand up? Great. Yes, sir. I did. Dr. Healy, I also have a question. Um, I have two questions, actually. What are the two differences between the vaccines? So both the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine use the messenger RNA um, methodology. Um, and they really approach it from the perspective of creating something in the lab that then can attach to a protein um, and then help activate your cells. Some of the other vaccine, and they're neither one of those are live. So one of the also myths we wanted to dispel is that you will not get the vaccine, you will not get the virus from this vaccine. Um, now, there are a number of other vaccines that are underway um, that do have some differences in technology that will use actually potentially live virus. Um, but these two are essentially similar to just developed by different companies in different pathways. Okay, and do you know the long, and, well, the short-term and long-term effects of the vaccines? Well, short term, what we've been seeing is the side effects that we've explored with both of those vaccines have really consisted of things like headaches, um, some fatigue, some muscle weakness or muscle fatigue, um, and occasionally some um, um, uh, muscle soreness from the injection site. 
Um, that's what we've seen on a number of uh, different trials with the different patients that have been um, through the trials. The long-term effects are obviously still to be understood, and we don't think that there's going to be anything that is significant. Um, but remember, we're really starting to just administer the vaccine in these phase three trials and now out in the public. But it is obviously something that we will continue to watch. The other thing I would say, um, and certainly some of the other panelists can jump in, there's a sense that we worked on the uh, COVID vaccine and then we kind of stopped all the research just to get it out. But there are still a number of people who are studying all the questions that you have around long-term effects, whether the other implications and another question that typically comes up is how long will it last? And we don't exactly know. Um, so one of the questions that people ask is, well, if I get the vaccine this fall, will I have to take, I mean, this winter, we'll have to take it next year. I don't think we exactly know that. Um, so we don't have a, an estimation of how long um, the antibodies will last. We know that they'll last for several months. Even the natural immunity we think is about three months. So we think this is longer. Um, but those are things that we're still trying to understand and study. And certainly any of the panelists can jump in and, and certainly offer their thoughts and expertise as well. Faith, this is uh, Dr. Barbell Johnson. Excellent questions. And uh, as usual, Dr. Haley hit all of the major points. Um, your question regarding what's the differences in the vaccine just kind of wanted to me to pause for a second just to remind uh, this group and others that, you know, these two vaccines are in a new class of vaccines, but we have other vaccines that will follow. So there will be information that you're hearing now that will probably be wonderful for these vaccines and will be relevant if you get if you're offered one of these two vaccines, but the information may be a little bit different depending on which vaccine you're offered or your family members are offered at that time. So um, the big overarching point that he made regarding safety and the way that we brought these, uh, these vaccines are coming to market via what the FDA calls an emergency use authorization process is something that I think you can help us to, to help others to understand that the process for all of the vaccines that will be used in this country um, will essentially go through the same exact process. A process that for physicians like me who have worked in this vaccine space for over a decade um, is very similar to what we have already experienced in vaccine trials. It is, like Dr. Haley said, a little bit accelerated because we needed to. It's a pandemic. We could not wait, but it did not, we did not cut any corners when it came, and we, not that I'm in the vaccine trial development process, but no corners were cut with regards to those phase to the phases. There are differences because each company created their vaccine their way. So there are differences in the populations that were tested a little bit between even these two vaccines. Um, there are differences in the timing that the vaccines might be um, administered. Uh, there are differences in how they came up with the dosing um, of the, and, and these are things that you may hear as we, as as other companies come up with their vaccines that may make you wonder why, why is one one dose and one's two doses? One dose better than two doses? So I just want you to be open-minded and remember that we're talking a lot about the two vaccines that are coming to market more than likely. Uh, Moderna's will be uh, in Florida within a short period here, but there are other vaccines that will follow. And when, when you and I and my family members and your family members are offered a vaccine, it may not be one of these two, but I want you to trust in the process and actually just be equipped with the science scientific uh, vigilance that I hope that this smart group of young people will actually have as you try to explain whichever vaccine we're talking about. I hope that helps. Great follow-up. Thank you. That's um, why she's the vaccine expert. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we are very fortunate. Um, Journey Butler, you, you have a question? Yes, I do. So the information that I was given about the Pfizer vaccine was that it had to be stored at a certain temperature, a frigid temperature, for it to be viable. And um, I don't know if you guys know, but there's a snowstorm in the north. So do you, so it may, de there may be delays in shipping and the shipping companies may not be able to get it out as quickly as it would take. So how can doctors be sure that if there is a delay, the vaccine won't like lose effectiveness and our hospitals making alternate plants for unforeseen circumstances like this? Great. A great question. question. 
And yeah. one of the thoughts is, so when we received the vaccine on Monday, it came in two large shipping containers. There were actually another two that came on Tuesday. Um, they actually weigh about 70 pounds a piece. So it includes several trays of the vaccine, basically the equivalent of about 4,000 doses in each of those trays, maybe a little bit more, but also was loaded with dry ice. So the way that the companies are shipping, at least the Pfizer vaccine, is with lots of dry ice to keep them cold. And those, that dry ice can last five days. So in fact, one of the recommendations from Pfizer is that at a minimum, you've got to change it out after five days. So you have a little bit of a five-day window um, in order to make sure that you can get the vaccine to where it can ultimately be stored. You are correct. It is a great question. The Pfizer vaccine has to be kept at minus 94 as it's being shipped and moved around and being stored um, until it's ready to be thawed. One of the advantages to the Moderna vaccine, which Dr. Johnson already pointed out, given sort of the difference in how they're made, it also has to be cold, but it doesn't have to be frozen at that same level. So there's a little bit more leeway in the Moderna vaccine. In fact, from the state perspective, one of the things that the state did was say, here, we're going to select five hospitals that are capable of storing this in an ultra-frozen level. And so that was how we were chosen, along with a number of other um, institutions around the state. But the Moderna vaccine, when it gets sent out um, next week, it will be sent to probably about 173 different hospitals. That's the current plan. I'm sure that number moves a little bit. And that's because it's a lot easier to ship. It's a lot easier to store. And it's easier for some of the smaller hospitals in the state to be able to um, keep cold and be ready to be chilled until it's ready to be used. Very interesting. I have a question. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Tiffany Powell had her hand up. Tiffany, ready? Uh, yes, uh, um, so I had two questions, and this is for any of the panelists. I was asking, why was there another vaccine created? Like, is it for certain people? Like, one vaccine was for, for one set of people, and then the other was for another set of people? Or how does that work? That is such an excellent question, Tiffany. You know, so if we think back of where we were in January when we were learning about all of this pandemic virus, there's just so much going on. Uh, scientists who are basically, we, we have our pulse on these kinds of situations, recognized that there was a need to bring a vaccine to market. We knew that we would need to have something in an armamentarium to basically help to fight uh, this virus. A number, of our, a number of companies were interested, a number of companies were at the table. Uh, why? Because we had no idea if one was going to succeed, if all were going to succeed, and we needed to take, use all of our as Dr. Uh, Haley said, all of our international power to fight something that was fighting us. This is like a broke best friend, you know, it just would not go away. And we saw it coming and we recognized that that is exactly what we needed to do. So it, in terms of, you know, everybody's at the party, everybody was at the party at the beginning. What we will not see is everybody at the party at the end because only those who are able to really truly show a quality vaccine that is efficacious that and is safe um, through the channels that we have will be the ones that we will allow in this country to be offered to the patients in our country. There are other vaccines that are, in addition to our two, there are vaccines that are already being distributed in other countries, um, some distributed before their research is completed or even reported. So we're, our, our system in this country is, is uh, by federal statute and, and ethical reasons, created to cre that we first do no harm. And even though there are things that may potentially, we may have side effects, we have to balance the risk and the benefit. So in looking at the risk and the benefit, we said it's risky to develop a vaccine, pay for a vaccine, manufacture a vaccine, and, and, and have gift states money to prepare for this vaccine that we may never have. But if we don't, if we decided to do it now, we wouldn't have a vaccine until next year or, or, or even further after that. So there are different products that are available because we had different companies at the table. We needed those companies, those who had the expertise, the scientists with expertise to develop the product. And then we're going to test the product by the science through the FDA, the same way that we've tested the product for diabetic medications, hypertensive medications, the vaccines that you got, the vaccines that you need before you go to college. It's the same system in the advisory committee. And I, I, I jumped on this call right after jumping off 
another call with a group of international or national scientists that were asking basically the same kinds of questions, you know, just making sure that all of our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted. So I'm going to sign off because I, I was such a great question, but I know that was too long of an answer. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. You know, there, there's a question in the chat about masks. And so one of the things I wanted to, to point out is um, somebody's asking how long we have to wear a mask and probably for a little bit longer. Um, because here's part of the question or the answer we've got to deal with is we've got to get enough people vaccinated to really make a difference so that enough people are vaccinated and immunized against this particular disease. So if you think about right now, we're focusing in on frontline hospital workers. Um, next week, we'll focus on other frontline hospital workers at another set of hospitals. And then you kind of, if you think of the CDC has kind of a tiered system of, you know, the sequence of how people need to be vaccinated. And really, if you think about it, by the time we can really get to the general public, we're into sort of late winter, early spring, then you've got to get enough people to take the vaccine, you know, probably in the 70, 80% range to really make a difference. So uh, good or bad, we're going to be wearing our masks for a little bit longer. We're going to have to continue to wash our hands. We're going to have to continue to create some elements of distance to keep ourselves safe. The other thing is one of the things we've studied with the, the vaccines, and Dr. Johnson can certainly correct me if I'm incorrect, while we know that the vaccine, and once you've had both doses, it does a really good job of preventing you from getting the disease. What we don't know yet is whether or not you could be vaccinated and potentially still carry the disease, the disease and give it to somebody else who's not vaccinated. Um, so we're going to continue wearing our masks for a little bit longer until we can get enough people vaccinated and we can understand more about whether it's transmitted or not and what the implications are. Great. Um, Jordan Bell, I, I think you have, you have a question, right? Um, so have you guys tested the people who have had COVID in the past or people who are currently having COVID? Have you guys used the vaccine on them to see how it affects them also? So the current recommendation from the CDC um, and, the, and the vaccine makers is if a person has active COVID, we do not give them the vaccine. Um, so if somebody is positive, obviously in the hospital, um, those are folks that we believe we will not give the vaccine, at least not in the initial phase. Um, the, um, and people have had the vaccine, I mean, had COVID in the past, um, I think the current set of recommendations is if it's longer than 90 days, then recommend that they go ahead and get the vaccine. Um, if they're still within that 90 day window, um, that they wait until the next phase of delivery. Um, that's believed because there is some immunity that's created when you have COVID and recover for about 90 days. So that's kind of the recommendation that we're following right this minute, um, but not to give it to active people, if you're within that 90 days to wait, if you're outside of that 90 days to go ahead and give it um, because that is the anticipation to get you to a greater degree of uh, immunity. Great. I know we're coming up on your end of Dr. Haley's window, so um, definitely want to use the other experts, but maybe um, you can take one more question and then we'll make sure to involve the others too. Sure. Um, Maya, you have a question? Yes, good evening. I do have a question. So my question is concerning to who who should not take the vaccine. For example, a person with MISC or multi-inflammatory syndrome in children or somebody who is recovering from cancer or recovering from MISC, you know, I just want to know who can take the vaccine and who cannot. Good question. Who wants Great to question. Dr. Um, Haley or somebody yeah, else? Or? Yeah, I mean, there, there are certainly guidelines that the CDC is recommending. People um, that are pregnant can get the vaccine. People that are lactating can get the vaccine. People that have recovered from cancer can get the vaccine. Um, people that are immunized are still studying, but I think the general consensus is, um, depending upon what the immunity is, they can take the vaccine. Um, uh, people who have allergies, you probably heard about a couple of people in, um, in England who got the first dose and had an allergic reaction. So general allergies, they can take the vaccine. Um, allergies to medications can take the vaccine. But people who have had an allergic reaction to a vaccine is a one group that's not recommended um, to get it at this particular point in time. Um, so those are some of the groups that we're looking at right now as it relates to who can and who can't take the vaccine. But there's a full set of guidelines that we follow with the CDC um, to make sure that we can, we can um, make sure we're being consistent. All right. Okay. Great. Kind of joined in there, Maya. Um, Dr. Rackett. 
as far as the age ranges, the Pfizer vaccine is only indicated down to age 16. Um, Missy, we tend to see in younger children. So unfortunately, they are not an eligible population. We get that question in our office. And the Moderna vaccine, I understand the tentative proposal is 18 and up. So it, it will be a period of time before pediatric patients routinely um, are eligible to be a part of the study. And then um, to go back, speaking about vaccines, eventually, and I know this always brings joy in all my patients when we tell them there's another vaccine for them. Um, when it's delivered in our office to answer Journey's questions about delay, uh, and, and Dr. Haley can probably back this up with the doses from Pfizer. Pfizer actually created their own storage facilities to transport them, so they had extra long freezer shelf life. Um, and when we receive things in our office, there is always an indicator inside that tells us if it has ever gone outside of the range so that you can be sure that no matter where you're getting it, even if there was, and there are holds up all the time um, with all sorts of vaccines, there will always be an indicator in there so that, that whoever's administering your vaccine will know this is not something we can use, we're gonna have to send it back, or this is something we can use, and it's just as viable as it was when it left the manufacturing facility. That's absolutely correct. And I apologize, I have to jump off, but that's a great point. Um, we do track it. All of them had, all the shipping containers had GPSs on them. They all have a temperature gauge on them, so we're able to manage them. Um, I would just encourage you to, uh, as Dr. Johnson said earlier, you know, follow the science. A phenomenal number of scientists um, that were involved in this project from across the globe um, and in the United States, very stringent safety efficacy protocols that we followed, yes, in a shortened fashion, but still follow them the way we best um, handle it. Um, and I would say go ahead and get the vaccine for certainly when, when, if you are eligible and if your parents are eligible and when that becomes available, it's safe. I felt comfortable taking it and um, I haven't grown a third head yet. So have a good evening, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add to the temperature thing. So there's a there's a temperature regulatory things that are important. As you've heard, there's extreme temperatures needed for the shipping and the storage of the first product that we have, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Um, and there, the upcoming vaccine, it won't require that stringent, but there still are temperature regulations. And then hopefully um, Johnson & Johnson will follow and will be approved and it requires even less um, temperature issue, has less temperature issues. But I want to say that once a vaccine arrives at the physician's office, we've been asked to prepare for months to purchase all sorts of regulatory things, refrigerators, um, create our, our technology and our IT system so that we can track and have daily records of this vaccine. So because this is a little bit different, this is not like the vaccines that have had the kind of shelf life that we've had before. Um, and the viability of this vaccine depends on the temperature being shipped at that temperature and stored at that temperature and then being administered at the right temperature in the right way. So there's a, there is a process uh, that must be in place um, for this vaccine and that's the only way that it can be done properly. So we have all been training as a medical community for months. Um, and there is online training that we're required to have and our teams are supposed to have so that we can make sure that before you come in and receive a vaccine, whenever that is, or your parents or grandparents, because they may be first, that we have those things in place. And we are um, obligated by our licenses and by the bodies that regulate us to make sure that those things are in place. And then additionally, we are obligated to report anything that happens to you, even if you have pink eye or whatever, we are obligated uh, to report any side effects that you have. We are obligated, that's in excess of what we know to be normal for vaccines. We are legally mandated to report those things as is the sponsor. You will have an opportunity at this point to report symptoms in the beginning. I think that the system is in place for uh, patients who receive the vaccine to have an app and, and to report self-report symptoms so that we can continue this body of information. But this is such a regulated process. The, the fat lady hasn't sung yet on this. We are continuing the trials and we are continuing to collect information. So we'll probably have a lot more information about all of these vaccines in two years than we have right now, simply because the real world pro 
experience is going to teach us more than any control trial could have. Great, thank you. Um, Ashley Buchanan. I don't know if Ashley's there. Um, yes, she's there. I'm, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I do realize that y'all said the vaccine was able, pregnant ladies were allowed to take the vaccine, but from my knowledge, vaccines travel through the bloodstream. So you said that children weren't allowed to get the vaccine unless they were 16 of age to for one vaccine and 18 years of age for the other vaccine. So is it really truly safe for pregnant ladies to get the vaccine? That's a good question, Ashley. Thank you. I don't know who would be best, uh, I'll, I'll, Dr. Atkins, or um, I don't know who would be jump on that one. The researcher. <laughs> Maybe I can just start just to kind of tell you how we come up with um, how we know what we know. So Pfizer, for example, created a, a, a protocol for how we're going to do this vaccine. And it says we need patients in this study. And we have one on, you know, a research, former research patient on this call. But we need patients in the study. And there, there's a, a group of rules that we must follow as well for who we're going to enroll. So they said uh, for Pfizer's vaccine, we want patients 16 to, I don't know what, I forgot what their top age was, but let's say 16 to 95. And so the information that you get back in studying those who were exposed to uh, uh, COVID, who received COVID-19 at the point that they were reporting the data have to happen in that study. And the patients in the study was the only way that we could report on that data. So we had patients 16 and above to test the efficacy and the safety. Somewhere before our report, their reporting uh, timeline, they increased the age range for the study and said, hey, you know what, we, we can probably use this, since that this is safe data, to increase the experience, uh, research knowledge, and let's include 12 to 16 year olds. So there's a new group of patients, 12 to 16 year olds, in the Pfizer study that are being currently being recruited and currently being tested. And we'll have that data to say truly what happens in the 12 to 16 year olds. But we can also use the data that we know about other vaccines and in other phases of the trial to kind of put the picture together to say, we don't have the 12 year old, but it, it'll probably be safe. The FDA is the person and, and the uh, ACIP are, is the group that will tell us if the data supports that recommendation. In the same way, there were no pre we don't normally include pregnant women in trials. Why? You know, again, first do no harm. Like we want to get the information, but we don't want to put people at unnecessary risk. So we didn't have pregnant women sign up and say, hey, can you can I get the vaccine? But what happens in the trial? Women got pregnant. So we have we got the experience of the safety of the women who got pregnant within the trial to actually report on that. Now those numbers are small and then research is something that we call, you know, statistical significance. And so we can report the data, but until we see what happens um, long term, that information and, and the science supports that based on how this vaccine works, it should be safe. Initially, no one wanted to actually make any recommendations for use in a population that wasn't tested, but we recognize that the impact of COVID itself is so important in these groups that we said we need to include pregnant women and lactating women in the group that we protect. And so organized medicine advocated for them not to be left out as a group of people that we immunize. And we have uh, asked Bethany and Dr. Atkins to go on ahead and address that. Uh, the yeah. other side of the coin. Yeah, okay, thanks, Rogers. Um, Ashley, that is an excellent question. And actually, I know Sophia, you said you were in the Moderna. I'm actually patient 67 in the Pfizer trial, and we had to prove we were not pregnant every time we walked in. Um, and, and my baby's 19. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a few years. Um, and But it, exactly as Dr. Barbell Johnson said, younger women than I did get pregnant. Um, and I just found out three hours ago, it was the real stuff, yay. Um, and I don't have two heads either. So Dr. Haley doesn't, I don't, it's, it's good. Um, but I also want you to understand it. And we get this question because we deal with the moms that you know are all sorts of things. Um, first of all, we can't, as pediatricians, 
we can't give anything to children. There's, we're no longer allowed to, we call grandfather in things. That law was passed years ago. It actually has to be studied on children. Uh, decades ago, we could just say, well, it works for the 25 year old, therefore let's give it to the two year old. We, we aren't allowed to do that. We actually have to study it. And that's um, why we have different age groups. And that's true for every medicine vaccine. But the way this medicine works, or the way the vaccine works, is it takes the messenger RNA in, it sends basically blueprints to the ribosomes. And for you guys in sixth grade, you'll learn what they are eventually. Um, but they are the protein makers in your body, okay? But it cannot cross across the placenta. Mom's the one making the antibodies, the ribosomes, they make this little protein, the protein gets spit out, it's a protein that then the white blood cells, for lack of a better term, they gobble it up. Um, they're like, we don't like you, they make antibodies. If they ever see that protein again, they're gonna come and get those. Um, those proteins and they're gonna destroy them. Now that you're very accurate that mom's antibodies can pass along and we actually utilize that. We give all pregnant mothers um, the, the happy uh, tetanus booster that you guys got in sixth grade. I'm sorry about you sixth graders there too. Um, okay. We all get a tetanus booster with whooping cough coverage and that actually helps protect that newborn baby for the first six to eight weeks until he or she can get their whooping cough shot. Um, so we know incidentally, like Dr. Barbell Johnson, it was not, I'm, I'm just going out on a limb here, statistically significant the number of women who got pregnant, but I guarantee you the number was more than zero. Um, and probably when we're talking between the two studies, both are mRNA studies, 75,000. Um, okay, admittedly some of us are not going to get pregnant, but there were enough younger women like Sophia that, that you know, they, they ask you not to. But the other thing is, I will continue on in the study, and Sophia can speak to this. I'll continue on the study until 2022. Um, every six months, I believe it is, I have to go in and get blood drawn, especially now that I know I was in the actual test group. Um, so, the babies actually could potentially benefit from it, but we're not actually giving the mRNA vaccine in any way, shape, or form to the fetus uh, itself. Thank you. I don't know if uh, Sophia, if Ms. Upshaw, if you want to jump in, because I think the kids probably, students would love to hear your experience being part of a, the trial. Do, do you know whether you got um, the actual vaccine or not? Do you know now? So I knew from the start, actually. So uh, to clarify, all the, at least for Moderna, is all the phase one participants received the vaccine, but in different doses. So I was in group number two. Uh, so I received like 100 micrograms. Um, but I was very well aware that I received the vaccine. There's no placebo group. Uh, I think I was patient number 10, I think. So I was one of the first or second people to get vaccinated in the Atlanta area after the people in Seattle had been vaccinated. Um, and so, yeah, like uh, Dr. Atkins said, uh, we weren't allowed to get pregnant. We, you know, <laughs> had to have pee tests, blood tests. Um, and I'm surprised that your involvement is a lot longer because my involvement ends in April of 2021, and I started in March of this year. So I was looking at my calendar, and um, someone's question in the group chat was about how long after the first vaccine do you get the second? I don't know if they're mandating now, but from my calendar, my first vaccination was on March 27th, and then my second one was on April 24th. So it was about a month apart, if that answers the question. So I'm not really sure what they'll mandate for um, other people getting the vaccine. I just, my understanding is Pfizer's is three weeks and Moderna's is uh, four weeks. Yes, it's okay, gotcha. 21, Pfizer's 21 days, 28 days, there's a, there's a little bit of a wiggle, uh, wiggle room there, but I just wanted to clarify too uh, what, what kind of, what phase of the study um, you were in for those who aren't aware. So what happens is usually we have an animal model, um, you can feel some kind of way about that, in which we test uh, the, the vaccine product. And then when the vaccine enters humans for trials, um, we start in, in, in a phase one trial. It's a very small trial. 
usually 40, 50, 60 people, not a lot of people, but young, healthy people, the healthier, the better, like our, our, our guest panelist here. And then we get some information about safety and efficacy just from that little group. Sometimes we do dose escalation to see if, you know, does 100 micrograms give you a lot of side effects, but 50 micrograms does the same job, but you don't have as many side effects, let's go with 50. So that's what phase one is for. We use the phase one data to basically get the phase two study going, which really is when you hear about these uh, late phase trials and the 44,000, we're talking about those phase two and three trials where we get lots more people so that we can diversify the types of people. Like grandma and grandpa, 95 year olds were in phase two and three trials, but they, could, they were not gonna be in a phase one trial. So we just use the phase one trial to kind of get the ball rolling. And then to see if, if you get a response from the vaccine product that's appropriate between the timing that you're thinking. So then we can use that to form a vaccine trial that says you get dose one on day one and one on dose two on day 21 or however you design it. But I just wanted to clarify that. And the recommendations that then come out at the end of the phase trial review such as the ones that we have now, give you a date for the trial. So when you were talking about vaccines being held up because of snow, well, that's important because we've already given people dose one. You need to have dose two to be in town at your office in stock when that dose is, when that dose is due. So supply and demand is extremely important. So all of you process engineers and, and other types of career professionals, th this is such an incredible intricate symphony of careers that are required. In addition to the medical community, we are totally dependent on so many people to make this work. And we're hoping that it does to get us out of mask. <laughs> great, great point. Um, I think Faith, do you have a, a, a follow-up for Sophia? Something she hasn't answered yet? Yes, yeah, sir. Ms. Upshaw, I, wanted, I had a question. Uh, why did you volunteer to be in the vaccine trial? And what was your experience like? How was the results? What was the outcome? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so when I first volunteered, uh, I guess I can tell you that's how I heard about it. So I was a grad student at the time at Georgia Tech and Emory University. And so uh, Emory University is where they were starting the phase one trials. And so I had heard about the word of mouth and I thought, okay, let me you know check out this trial. Um, and so I called and asked a lot of questions and I ultimately decided to you know, start being screened and go through the screening process. And I'd say at the time, uh, this was mid-March, it was March 16th. I remember the exact day I called. It was March 16th and I called um, to volunteer because I remember at the very beginning, it was very, um, everyone was scared, the city was locking down, um, the school shut down, everything was shutting down at a very scary time. And um, you see a lot of people helping in whatever capacity they can. And so I figured, oh, look at this opportunity that presents itself to me, it's local. Uh, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm in the, you know, the demographics that they're looking for, let me volunteer, and I happened to pass the screening. Um, and as far as my experience, I had a very positive time. Um, I definitely enjoy getting to go to the uh, vaccine clinic and the nurses that helped me out and the doctors I got to talk to. Um, I definitely kept it a secret from people that I was involved. <laughs> I didn't tell my boss, I didn't tell my family members for a while, I didn't tell friends, uh, maybe just one friend um, and I just kept it a secret mostly because I didn't want other people's opinions affecting what I decided to do with my body. Um, so as far as the actual vaccination, everyone always wants to know about that. Um, imagine like you're getting a flu shot and you know, you just get stabbed, it hurts a little bit. Um, and, but my experience and I guess all the other phase participants also had to wait for a while after being vaccinated because they have to monitor for adverse events. And so that's why I had to sit there for about an hour and then I went home. Uh, arm is sore, you're a bit fatigued, you're maybe you have a headache, you feel a little bit feverish, but that's only lasts for a day or two, just like the flu vaccine if you guys get it every year. Um, so the symptoms weren't anything, you know, to be, to call my family and tell them, <laughs> tell them that I'm worried or anything. Um, and the people that were involved in the trial were amazing and really sweet and nice. Uh, they called and checked in, uh, they monitored my symptoms. I came in every week. And uh, as far as my participation, I would come to the clinic 
uh, just about every week and then it got more spaced out to the point where my last visit was in October of this year and my next one is in April of next year. So it got more spaced out to the point where they realized, oh, it's been a few months, they seem fine, they'll contact us if there's anything wrong. Um, so yeah, I definitely trusted the people I got to work with and yeah, it was a great experience, I'd have to say. I'm not, I was scared, I'd say, you know, the day or two leading up to you and afterwards, but I think afterwards I just, um, it felt a lot more, I'm trying to find the words. It's just, it felt um, like, oh, is that it? That was my, <laughs> those are my thoughts uh, initially afterwards. So, yeah, I hope that answers some questions for you. Yeah, Th well, thank you for answering that. And thank you for doing that. I mean, you're part of the reason all of us will be able to be doing this soon. So thank you very much. Um, I correct myself, Mr. Woods, I'm sorry, because I misspoke about the phase one numbers and who was in the trial. So I'm assuming sure. actually you were in um, Moderna's um, 0003 trial. But actually, um, there were six, there were 120 people total in the phase one trial. And that included uh, half of those were actually 18 to 55, but 30 were actually 56 to 70, and 30 were 75 and older. So the, this phase one was different than the phase ones that we normally do, but I had to recheck my data to make sure that I was, I came correct for you all, for you stars. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to, do, do any of you have a question for Ms. Val, Valdez Lupi? I'd like to hear her perspective, but maybe one of the students has a um, um, question for her. Um, of course, Dr. Bernie's doctor, uh, Dr. Kane. I mean, Betty Bernie's doctor. Um, yes, so uh, if you have a question for either of those, maybe did Kaylee have her hand up? Um, yes. Yeah, I was wondering, I don't know if this is in your expertise, but I was wondering, because earlier, Mr. The other, Ms. earlier, Dr. Haley, he was as he was saying that the, the, vaccine is injected through the skin. And so I was wondering, since y'all said that kids younger than 16 years old, I was wondering if you were going to make a chewable for those kids so that they will be able to take it. Hmm. Great question. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that. Very good question. Who wants to take that one? I was going to pass on that because I, I actually think my kids, my teenagers, would prefer the chewable too. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so I will. Uh, I'm a public health person, not the clinic, not the uh, vaccine expert. So that is a great question. So I don't know. Yeah, uh, maybe um, Dr. Atkins being pediatrician. Yeah, my to answer that a pain-free uh, way to get the uh, vaccine. If it were up to me, everything would be a chewable and a nasal spray. Um, yeah. Bubble gum flavored. <laughs> bubble gum flavored, exactly. Um, yeah. I, I am not in the research realm. This is a respiratory vac virus. So theoretically, going back from my biomedical engineering days, when I did research, um, there's potential that it could eventually be a respiratory, probably live attenuated vaccine like but that's also assuming it sticks around i'm hoping it it gets taken care of and is not the issue it is now but if it sticks around long enough i'm sure there's going to be somebody who figures out some better way than a needle although unfortunately sometimes that's the only way to do it i um i wanted to have some insider information i'm sorry did i cut off the world's best doctor uh, dr Kane? i apologize <laughs> No, no, go ahead. I, I have my comment after. But, but I would be remiss if I didn't let you know that there are there is a company actually Merck who actually is studying an oral vaccine, not necessarily because it is um, it, it's going to be more efficacious. But when you think about this, this is a pandemic. Think about all the things that we're doing, PPE wise, needles and gowns, and then think about all the people in sub-Saharan Africa and and all the other places that we must get this vaccine to. So in addition to our um, rich developed world country thinking process about getting us safe and protected, we really need to be our brother's keeper. So there are companies that are at the table looking at that very same thing. One, because it's kids, but, but for adults, because we need something that we can distribute to keep the world safe. And it should not just be something that developed company, countries with lots of money, um, should have right we should be able to vaccinate and protect everyone 
who is exposed to COVID-19. And so we're looking as a, as a community, a responsible community of ways to do that. I don't know if it will come to market or not, but I do know that um, those, those uh, protocols have been developed. Um, as um, uh, as uh, I'd like to piggyback on what Dr. Johnson, Barbara L. Johnson said and Dr. Atkins said, stated, as, um, as well as uh, Ms. Valdez. As a uh, my my first I, my first job was as a pharmacist, so uh, coming from the pharmacist perspective, there's vehicles or mechan uh, there's mechanism of delivery in terms of how you deliver a drug to a person, and those those uh, uh, those mechanisms depend on the stability and the reactivity of the drugs to whatever environment that is in. And I know some of these uh, vaccines have been wrapped up in nanoparticles, as they say. That's when nanotechnology comes back into play uh, with a lot of this. A lot of those drugs are wrapped up uh, in those types of envelopes that will not survive the either the, the, the gastric acid or the stomach acid. And uh, other environment, other than being injected into the muscle, for which there's a amount of, certain amount of fat and other materials in there that will allow that vaccine to survive or the agent to survive. So while I'm hopeful, because I'm a wimp when it comes to getting shot, I can order them real quickly for anybody. Yes. Okay. But I, I hate taking them myself, uh, but I will <laughs> if I want to live. Um, uh, I'm hoping that they're able to come up with a mechanism by which to deliver that drug, but uh, expediency, as Dr. Kim Barbara Johnson is stating, expediency is of the urgent, utmost important at the moment. Um, Tiffany Powell, do you have a question? Yes, I had a question. So it was said that um, there's like a certain procedure that you have to go to just to make sure you're not pregnant or anything like that. So it was said that sometimes you have COVID-19, but you don't experience any symptoms. So what if you do get the vaccine and you have COVID-19, but it's not detected at that time? So what would happen? Like some, would something bad happen with what, what would happen? Good question. So um, there are actually patients and studies that was like that. So, um, and that is a very amazing question. So. We are not pre-testing you before vaccines. You could be an asymptomatic carrier of COVID or asymptomatic COVID positive patient. Um, and that's not gonna be required because we, it, it, has proven, it was proven to be safe in the trials uh, for those patients who were COVID positive uh, before dose one. Um, there are also patients who became COVID positive after dose after dose one. So there is data that will come out at least from the first two vaccines and we'll see if that kind of information is similar with the other vaccine candidates that will follow. I think um, Valdez Lupe you have a question. You do have a good question to throw out there to all of them. So if you could. Yeah, no, I, I thank you so much. I'm just so impressed by all these really smart questions that you're all asking us. And I, I have worked in, in public health, which works with all the doctors, uh, like the ones on the call today, uh, to get the vaccines and to get information out. And one of my best um, memories of working in the health department is with young people, youth health ambassadors, because you're gonna be great ambassadors for getting this information out to your family members, uh, to your friends. And so from that, and now I work in a foundation. And what we're trying to figure out is what are the types of resources would be most helpful to people like you, young people, since you're gonna carry this message. So I, I would love to ask any of you that question in terms of you know, what kind of uh, information or resources would help you get the word out for all of us um, to make sure that when the vaccines are coming into your communities, that as many people who are able to actually trust the process and are getting vaccinated. Dr. Um, Valdez Lupe, um, Jordan Bell at our recent Leader to Leader Summit talked about using a vehicle that we already have. And then your question would help that. Jordan, can you share what your suggestion was, one of your solutions was with regards to using the app and um, the YouTube? 
podcast? Um, I'm a star has developed a podcast, a YouTube channel, and a app over the past year. So to get the word out, we could use the podcast to ask you medical professionals questions that we would like to know. And the YouTube channel could promote healthy habits or try our best to persuade the audience in order for people to take the vaccine because this is all we really have right now since we're in a pandemic. This is all we can really go off of. There's not really an option. We all need to come together as a community and make a decision. So I think those, those are great in terms of, uh, I'm really intrigued by the app uh, that you've all developed, uh, but I think you're right in terms of the podcast and the YouTube and making sure that the right information um, gets out there is gonna be uh, helpful. And I, I love the questions that you're asking such, they're just really smart questions. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that we need a source to get your questions. <laughs> I know, and we're, we're happy to provide them. I know there's not a person on this call who's volunteered who wouldn't be happy to be a guest or to answer questions or to respond to your questions if you reached out to us. But I think what, what we're really itching for is an opportunity to have your brain. So think about what are you thinking about? I know Dr. Atkins probably has the best job in the world because she gets to see those like you every day. But, you know, I'm a mom. I have a 17-year-old and a 21-year-old. And so I know kind of how the whole college campus thing was going in Cincinnati and how, you know, St. John's County was handling COVID from my, from my high schooler. And that's really what made me smart. <laughs> You know, so imagine them plus you all in my life, I'll be Mensa. So um, also let us know, you know, how we can get more information um, from those of you in this foundation so that we can arm ourselves better. We can prepare the information that you need and we can be your advocates and allies too, to say these are the questions of the teens in our community and we need better answers or better education or better material. And I think that's what uh, Dr. Lupi was talking about as well, yes? Well, Dr. Dr. Johnson uh, uh, has opened the door to something that I really wanted to make sure I got out. And that is, um, because she's talked that she's a mom uh, of these young, these older teenagers, because they're getting the clear out of the teenage years. Um, I just want you guys to be cognizant of whatever, re whatever actions you guys take in terms of what you do in the community, uh, whether it's you know, hanging out with your friends or anything else that you may do that w may cause you to uh, uh, become infected with the virus. And even though you may not be as sick as what you hear about other people being sick uh, when they get the virus, just want to make sure I remind you that you do take it home to your parents. And as much as you may disagree with them sometimes, you definitely want to make, I mean, you always want to make sure that your mom, your dad, your grandmother, you know, and your great grandmother, whom some, you know, uh, a lot of people in the African American community have multi generational households. And so you want to make sure that you do everything you can to make sure that they survive. So you have to protect them from your friends, you know, whether it's at school or anywhere else. Because while you may not have the virus today, exposure uh, to others particularly when it's unnecessary, uh, will, may, uh, may cause you to take it back home. And I really, you know, to old folks like me, okay, who, who may not survive uh, if infected with the virus. And I can do everything I can to keep it out of my household. And my last experience was with, um, it almost got into my household because of one of my kids deciding, you know, I call them kids with ill. Um, uh, one of my kids decided they wanted to go and do some things that were relatively selfish, in my opinion, which I politely told her. But she almost brought it into the household, and in a quick and dirty, a quick uh, a way of expressing this would be, they did go, um, they went to a wedding, they had a great time at the wedding, they came, they were, wanted to, they live in D.C., they wanted to come and visit their mom, however, they, they went away and did a rapid, a quick rapid test that came up negative, you know, and when they decided to come here, I said, nope, that's not good enough. I gotta go ahead and do uh, a, a better test. Did a better test, it came up positive. And so she has older grandparents, I mean, older parents uh, that might not have survived that infection. She was just blessed, 
in terms of her feeling guilty for the rest of her life. And her father knew better, okay, and wanted to make sure that she didn't bring it home to her, her mother. You know, like most men with the macho attitude, like, oh, I'm a, good, I'm a big guy, I'll take it on, you know, for the, take the hit for the family. But even that's still not smart because uh, her mother is used to me being around for 42 years. And if I could help it, I'd be around for another 42 years. Uh, however, uh, I just wanted you guys to make sure there's a level of personal responsibility that you have in terms of your family. And so heed that warning very well. No, now I'm, I'm through being a parent. I go back to being a doctor. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Kane. Well said. Um, and yeah, we hate to, I mean, I know that there's more questions out there, which I hate to not get around to them because you guys are doing a great job, as I said, better than journalists have coming up with these questions. Um, but we're, we really wanted to try and keep it to an hour. So um, we're going to wrap it up. And so I'm going to say thank you to the medical experts. Thank you to the students. Um, and yeah, echo that um, this is the vaccine is really, really positive. What a, what a light at the end of the tunnel. But we also have to be extremely careful that we had some of our highest numbers. We had our highest day last week, you know, higher than any time earlier. So we, we just, we, we can't let up now. Um, I think Jordan mentioned being a community. We all have to be in this together now. Um, and you guys, I know, have that spirit. So thank you. Thanks to everybody for doing this. I really appreciate it. I want to thank everybody as well, but I want to say this. Let's do this again. <laughs> yes, we will. Yes, we have to. Okay. We have to. And um, I'd just like to say thank you so much to the panelists for taking the time out of your busy schedule. I know sometimes when you hear that as kids, sometimes people think, oh, I don't know. But these young people have dedicated themselves to being researchers. They've dedicated themselves to living up to the acronym of being smart, talented, and resilient. And we're going to keep up with all of you because um, that's the only way we're going to do it. As Jordan said, we're all in this together. And I um, would love to make sure that I tell Kaylee that I got lots of people texting me after what you said. So um, that, was, that was great, my little middle schooler. And uh, <laughs> all of you were great. And so normally, um, as executive director of I'm a Star, I understand that it's the kids' voices we want to hear. So I won't close out. I will actually ask Cameron Dees to close out for us. Good evening, everyone. I am Cameron Dees, a ninth grade student at Paxson School for Advanced Studies. As student leaders in the I'm a Star Foundation, we are taught that the essence of leadership is service to mankind. Tonight's community conversation allows my star colleagues and I to provide a service to our community. We will take the information and facts that we gain tonight and carry the message on to others. On behalf of Mrs. Bernie and the I'm a Star Foundation, I would like to thank the panel for empowering us with knowledge. I especially want to thank the Florida Times Union editor, Mrs. Mary Kelly Palka, and the Florida Times Union staff, and tonight's moderator, Mr. Mark Woods, for partnering with us in this endeavor. I leave you with this thought. Knowledge is power, and knowledge shared is power multiplied. Our goal is to share our knowledge to create a better world. Thank you for joining us, and happy holidays. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you.